The webinar will begin soon. Please stand by. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Morell, and I work in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of CDC's One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly zoonoses and One Health Updates call on April 5th, 2023. Next slide, please. Although the content of this webinar is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, CDC has no control over who participates. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality cannot be guaranteed. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect now. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash 2023 slash april.html. Next slide. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following five objectives. Identify an implication for human, animal, and environmental health. Identify a one health approach strategy for prevention of public health threats. Identify a One Health approach strategy for detection of public health threats. Identify a One Health approach strategy for responding to public health threats. And list two ways to improve collaborative practice across the public health care team. Next slide. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products suppliers of commercial services or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses or partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash continuing education. The course access code is zohu webcast. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by May 8th, 2023. A captioned video of today's webinar will be posted at cdc.gov slash one health slash sohu slash 2023 slash april.html within 30 days. To receive free CE for the web on demand video of today's webinar, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by May 9th, 2025. Before we begin today's presentations, Dr. Colin Basler, Deputy Director of the One Health Office, will share some news and updates. You may begin when you're ready. Thanks, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the April Zohu call. We'd appreciate you sharing the Zohu call website link cdc.gov backslash one health backslash Zohu with your colleagues from the public health, agriculture, wildlife, plant, environment, and other relevant sectors, and letting them know about the live webinars, video recordings, and free continuing education that the Zohu calls offer. Before our presentation begins, I'd like a moment to share some updates and resources. As always, you can find links to these resources in today's Zohu call email newsletter. If you aren't yet subscribed to the newsletter, please sign up using the link at the top of the main Zohu Call webpage. You can continue to find on CDC's website the latest COVID-19 guidance and resources for keeping people as well as animals safe and healthy. Next slide, please. 
Today's newsletter highlights several publications, including a recently published CDC technical report on highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1 viruses, as well as USDA's 2022 National Wildlife Research Center Accomplishments Report, Accomplishments report titled Innovative Solutions to Human Wildlife Conflicts. Next slide, please. Here are additional uh, highlighted publications, including a Geographic Information System Protocol for Mapping Areas Targeted for Mosquito Control in North Carolina, and a WHO white paper titled Prevention of Zoonotic Spillover. Next slide, please. Lastly, for publications, we've highlighted a couple of MMWR notes from the field focused on dengue. The, uh, including the first evidence of locally acquired dengue virus infections in Maricopa County, Arizona. We'll actually be hearing more about this topic on the May Zohu call. Next slide, please. We've shared links to web resources and announcements, including an updated web page, a CDC's Federal One Health Coordination, and the H5N1 bird flu current situation summary. Next slide, please. Uh, additional resources include uh, Legionnaires disease resources for environmental health professionals. Next slide. And we even have a few multimedia resources, including a YouTube video called From Inspector to Investigator, Finding the Factors that Lead to Foodborne Outbreaks, and a JAFMA podcast featuring CDC expert Amanda Liu talking about SARS-CoV-2 in dogs and cats. Next slide. Some events and observations of interest for April include National Wildlife Week, which runs from April 5th to April 9th, National Dog Bite Prevention Week, which is April 9th to 15th, Earth Day, which was on April 22nd, and the 2023 uh, AIS will take place here in Atlanta, Georgia from April 24th to 27th. Next slide, please. Finally, in addition to an ongoing listeria outbreak, in addition to ongoing listeria outbreaks, there is a new salmonella outbreak linked to flour and an outbreak of hepatitis A virus infections linked to frozen organic strawberries. Next slide. You can visit healthy, a CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website for a selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases and find additional details about ongoing U.S. outbreaks on the CDC websites linked from today's newsletter. Our next Zohu call will take place on May 3rd, 2020. Please continue to send presenter and questions for future presentations, as well as news from your organizations to zohucall at cdc.gov. That's Z-O-H-U-C-A-L-L at cdc.gov. Now I'll turn the call back over to Laura. Thank you. You can submit questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature please include the topic or presenter's name. The Q&A session will follow the final presentation if time allows. You can also email questions to today's presenters. We've included their email addresses on this slide, on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar, and in today's email newsletter. Next slide. Our first presentation, Foodborne Illness Outbreaks Linked to Unpasteurized Milk and the Relationship to Changes in State Laws, United States. Uh, is by Dr. Sean Stapleton. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you so much, Laura. Hi, everyone. My name is Sean Stapleton, and I'm a veterinarian and an epidemiologist with CDC's enteric zoonosis activity. And today I'll be presenting on a recent study that was published as a collaboration between multiple groups at CDC and the Food and Drug Administration about foodborne illness outbreaks linked to unpasteurized milk and the relationship of these outbreaks to changes in state laws pertaining to unpasteurized milk. And this is gonna cover data that was collected between 1998 to 2018. Next slide. So consumption of unpasteurized or raw milk is known to transmit various types of pathogens, such as Campylobacter, Cryptosporidium, Shigatoxin producing E. coli, Listeria, and Salmonella. In addition, and in addition to the acute gastrointestinal illness that can occur from most of these pathogens, these infections can also have long-term consequences, such as through kidney failure resulting from hemolytic uremic syndrome, Guillain-Barre syndrome, 
or functional bowel disorders. And these pathogens can lead to hospitalization and unfortunately even death. Pasteurization ensures that fluid milk and milk products do not contain harmful pathogens by heating every particle of the milk to a high enough temperature for a long enough amount of time to ensure that illness causing pathogens in the milk are killed. And the invention of pasteurization resulted in dramatic reductions in illnesses and infant mortality once it was implemented throughout the dairy industry. Next slide. Now, fortunately, the prevalence of unpasteurized milk consumption in the United States is relatively low, with weekly consumption estimates ranging between 1% to 2% of the United States adult population. In comparison, estimates of the consumption of pasteurized milk in a population-based survey have been reported as high as 70% of the surveyed population saying that, yes, they did drink pasteurized milk in the week prior to interview. However, what studies have shown us is that raw milk, even though it is consumed far less frequently, leads to more outbreaks and illnesses compared to pasteurized milk. One example of this, one study used data from 1993 to 2006 and estimated that the incidence of outbreaks involving unpasteurized dairy products was approximately 150 times greater per pound of dairy product consumed compared to the incidence of outbreaks involving pasteurized products. Next slide. Now all milk and milk products that are in their final package form for human consumption must be pasteurized before shipping from one state to another or interstate. And this is mandated by the United States Food and Drug Administration or FDA as of 1987. Next slide. However, each state determines whether unpasteurized milk can be sold within state borders and what the legal points of access are. So states might allow sale at retail stores, such as grocery stores, or they might limit sale to farmer's markets or on the farm, specifically where the unpasteurized milk is produced. And then finally, some states might also allow unpasteurized milk access through cow shares or herd shares. And this is a little bit of a nuanced term, um, but it essentially is referring to the process of an individual purchasing an ownership interest in a cow or a herd, and then receiving a portion of any unpasteurized milk that's produced. And the study that I'll be discussing today sought to examine the impact of various state laws on the incidence of raw milk associated outbreaks and illnesses. Next slide. So to briefly go through the methods of this study, uh, first we obtained data from the CDC Foodborne Disease Outbreak Surveillance System, which is housed within the National Outbreak Reporting System. And one important exclusion criteria I want to point out is that our analysis did not include outbreaks that were linked to unpasteurized dairy products like cheese, ice cream, or yogurt, and also excluded outbreaks linked to flavored milks like chocolate milk. Um, this was done to more closely mirror the intent of the legal analysis, which I'll describe here in a second. From there, we performed a trend analysis to describe the change in the mean number of outbreaks and outbreak-associated illnesses linked to unpasteurized milk from 1998 to 2018. Next, our team of legal experts collected state statutes and regulations from 51 jurisdictions, so that's all 50 states plus the District of Columbia pertaining to the sale of unpasteurized milk for human consumption. Again, not examining laws related to dairy products like yogurt um, or ice cream or cheese, and also excluding laws related to raw milk sold as pet food or commercial animal feed. So those laws were excluded. And we described any changes to these laws in the examined timeframe. So we first conducted a cross-sectional assessment as of May 2019 of what were the laws at that point in time. And then we looked back as far as January uh, uh, 2012 uh, to determine if there were any amendments to these laws over that time period. 
And then finally, we compared the number of outbreaks and illnesses based on legal status. So for example, we compared the number of outbreaks and illnesses in states that allowed unpasteurized milk sale compared to states that prohibited sale. Uh, additionally, we compared the number of outbreaks and illnesses in states that allowed retail sale versus states that only allowed sale on farm. Next slide. So to dig into those results, first the trend analysis. Uh, what this trend analysis demonstrated is that raw milk associated outbreaks have increased over time. So in performing this analysis, we essentially chunked the 1998 to 2018 time period into three seven year time periods. And what you can see on that first line of this chart is uh, the mean number, the average number of outbreaks per year increased significantly over time. So in the first time period, we were seeing an estimated four outbreaks per year. Uh, in comparison, the second time period, 12.1 outbreaks per year. And in the third time period, 12.7 outbreaks per year. Now, we also looked at the number of outbreak-associated illnesses per year, and, and what you see here is a, is a predicted descriptive increase. So from the first time period, we saw 103 uh, outbreak-associated illnesses per year, and this increased to 142 outbreak-associated illnesses per year in the second time period, and 133 outbreak-associated illnesses per year in the third time period, but this was not a statistically significant increase. Next slide. So to specifically hone in on the outbreaks that occurred during the time period of our legal analysis, so 2013 to 2018, there were 75 outbreaks associated with unpasteurized milk. One of these outbreaks was a multi-state outbreak and the remainder were single state outbreaks. And there were 675 illnesses that were linked to unpasteurized milk. And one concerning finding was that 14% of these illnesses were children less than five years old and 34% were children between the age of five and 19. So collectively looking at almost 50%, almost half of illnesses in these outbreaks were children. 39% were female, 15% of patients were hospitalized and two deaths occurred during this time period. These outbreaks were caused uh, most commonly by Campylobacter, that was 49% of outbreaks, followed by Salmonella, 17%, Chigatoxin producing E. coli at 15%, Cryptosporidium at 11%, and then one outbreak caused by Listeria. There were also 7% of outbreaks caused by multiple pathogens. Next slide. Moving on to the legal analysis. So what this map shows is essentially how we categorize states based on their laws pertaining to our un unpasteurized milk as of May 2019. And just to run through this uh, color scheme on the right hand side, so the dark blue color indicates states that allowed retail sale of unpasteurized milk. The light blue is states that allowed sale only on farm. Yellow were states that prohibited sale but had express provisions allowing herd shares within their state. The orange indicates states that prohibit sale, but had no uh, mention of herd shares in their uh, legal code that we could identify. And then finally, that red color, which is one state, Louisiana, uh, expressly prohibits sale of unpasteurized milk and also expressly prohibits herd shares. So of all of these laws, there were 10 states that had amendments between the time period of 2012 to 2019. Um, 10 state or nine states, excuse me, expanded access. That's shown by the diagonal line. So Utah, Wyoming, North Dakota, Arkansas, Illinois, North Carolina, West Virginia, Connecticut, and Vermont all had laws or amendments to their laws during this time period that expanded access to unpasteurized milk. And then the dotted pattern, which is in South Dakota, was the one state that passed uh, an amendment to their law that restricted access. Collectively, uh, there were 27 states that allow sales, so 27 states that have that dark blue or uh, light blue shading, and then 24 jurisdictions, 23 states plus Washington, uh, or the District of Columbia, that are shaded in um, one of those warmer colors, the yellow, orange, or, or red. Next slide. 
And so what we found is that states where sale was allowed had 3.2 times more outbreaks, 78% of outbreaks compared to jurisdictions where sale was prohibited. So specifically in jurisdictions where sale was allowed, there were 58 outbreaks during the 2013 to 2018 time period versus 16 outbreaks in states where sale was prohibited. Additionally, states where that allowed retail sale, there were 46 outbreaks, which was 3.6 times higher uh, in comparison to states that uh, where sale was only allowed on farm. Next slide. So in conclusion, nearly half of illnesses occurred in children and state laws that result in increased availability of unpasteurized milk are associated with more illness outbreaks. Unpasteurized milk, unfortunately, continues to be a public health challenge in the United States, despite persistent recommendations against the practice. Next slide. So overall, it's important to educate parents of the health risks that unpasteurized milk consumption presents to children because so many children were included in these outbreaks and because children are often relying on their parents and caregivers to help make their decisions about um, what they're eating and what they're drinking. It's very important to continue to educate parents about the, the health risks associated with unpasteurized milk. Public health officials, veterinarians, Human healthcare providers and agricultural officials can all work together to continue to provide evidence-based recommendations to the public and to policymakers about the risks associated with increased availability of unpasteurized milk in order to prevent illnesses. Next slide. I'd like to acknowledge all of my co-authors on this paper, as well as thank the state, local, and territorial governmental partners who uh, contributed data to the National Outbreak Reporting System and conducted these investigations. Also like to thank the National Outbreak Reporting System. Next slide. You're welcome to reach out to me via my personal email or through my team's inbox, eza at cdc.gov. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to, to answer any questions about this publication and invite any who are interested to uh, read this paper, which is published in Epidemiology and Infection. Uh, I welcome any of your thoughts and questions and look forward to them at the end of the talk today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for your presentation. Let's go on to the next slide. Our next presentation, Releasing Male Mosquitoes with Wolbachia as a Population Suppression Method for Aedes aegypti Mosquitoes in Ponce, Puerto Rico, is by Dr. Liliana Sanchez-Gonzalez. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon. I will present the results of releases of male mosquitoes with Wolbachia to suppress the Aedes aegypti populations in Ponce, Puerto Rico. I work with the CDC Dengue branch in San Juan. Next. Let's start with some background for this project. Thank you. Dengue is the most common virus transmitted by mosquitoes globally, and it's endemic here in Puerto Rico. The global incidence of dengue is expected to continue increasing due to several factors that may be very familiar uh, for this audience. And these include urbanization, human migration, and climate change. Dengue is potentially fatal with no specific treatment available. Next. Just a couple of weeks ago, the WHO officially informed on a sharp increase in dengue and chikungunya cases in our region and their expansion beyond historical areas of transmission. And although dengue can be less commonly transmitted through blood transfusions, during birth, or through needle stick injuries, the overwhelming majority of transmission is vectorial, and prevention efforts are recommended to focus on the surveillance and the control of virus mosquitoes. Vector control continues to be essential to fight dengue, and we need more effective proven methods. Next. Wolvacia mediated population suppression, or Wolvacia suppression, is a technique in which male mosquitoes that are infected with a strain of Wolvacia bacterium are released so that they can mate with wild female mosquitoes. Because of cytoplasmic incompatibility, a sperm egg incompatibility, after mating, the female mosquito can lay eggs, but they don't hatch, resulting in a progressive reduction of mosquito populations over time. Next. Previous results of the use of this technique in Australia, in the US, and in Singapore. Next have shown important reduction of mosquito populations ranging from 72 to 95%. Next. 
the Communities Organized to Prevent Arboviruses, or COPA, is an ongoing research platform implemented here in Ponce, Puerto Rico in 2018, and it's a collaboration between the Ponce Health Sciences University, the Puerto Rico Vector Control Unit, and the CDC Stenge branch. And we collaborated with Verily for this specific project. COPA is a prospective cohort, so we seek to determine the incidence of arboviral infections like dengue and assess burden and etiology of acute viral illness in our population. We follow about 3,800 participants, ages 1 to 50, every year, and they answer a standardized questionnaire, provide us with a blood sample for arboviral testing, and we check for fever or other symptoms every week through text messaging to offer additional testing. Our participants live in 38 distinct clusters, and this allows us to for a cluster randomized trial design. Next. For the methods, next. Next. The pathogen and the vector targeted in our study are dengue and Aedes aegypti, and the human population is the COPA participants that I just described. Mm, the intervention is the release of male mosquitoes with Volvacia. Next. There was no intervention provided for our control areas. Next. And we were looking to evaluate both the reduction of female mosquitoes, so entomological outcomes, and human infection, so epidemiological outcomes. Next. Next. We started our educational campaign in June 2020, and three months later, the releases started in 19 or half of our study clusters. Female mosquitoes were monitored with AGO or Ocidal Gravid OV traps, about 604 traps. In the map, you can see the location of our 38 clusters, and the intervention clusters are here shown, shown in blue and the control clusters in pink. Next. Mosquitoes were reared and packed in the Verily facility in San Francisco. Next. They were shipped by air with a connection in the mainland US. They arrived in San Juan, next, then driven to Ponce, that is about 1.5 hours by road, next. They were unpacked, distributed into tubes in the lab, and then next, they were released in Ponce using very custom feed vents. So a very long and somehow complicated logistics process. Next. The releases occur in 19 clusters for about four months, and in December 2020, our analysis showed that the suppression levels were suboptimal. So we started a phase implementation, starting with four intervention clusters to be able to increase the overflowing ratios in these clusters. This is, these are the ratios of, female, of male mosquitoes with Volvacia to wild male mosquitoes before we could move to the next four and so on. The releases occur in these four clusters, and we had four clusters as, as controls for about 12 months. And we did not expand to additional clusters. As you will see, the releases ended in December 2021. Next. For determining the mosquito population suppression levels, we use a mixed model using the weekly trap counts of female Aedes aegypti mosquitoes so that we could obtain the ratio of mosquito counts in the intervention clusters to the control clusters. And during our study, different essays were used to determine mosquito characteristics, to calculate the overflowing ratios, and to evaluate the shipping conditions. Next. So what, we, what results we obtained? Next. There were no dengue cases detected by molecular text testing in our cohort during the study period, and this was consistent with the data that we have from passive and active surveillance. We only detected one participant with a positive serology test by IgM in one of our intervention clusters. So we had very low dengue transmission and insufficient data to assess human outcomes. What I'm going to show you are the entomological outcomes. Next. In this graphic, you can see the number of mosquitoes in millions released per week. We released a total of 96 million mosquitoes. The mosquito ships are shown in green, the, the ones that were released in orange, and the mosquitoes that arrived at the expected time in the dashed lines. Many, many of our shipments were delayed, and a third had a delay of 36 hours or longer. Some of our shipments never made it. When working in 19 clusters, we were releasing about a million mosquitoes every week, and this increased to an average of 2, millions, 2 million mosquitoes when we moved to only four clusters. Next. 
this graphic is showing the mean number of female mosquitoes per week on the white axis, and the control areas are showed show in purple and the treatment areas in yellow. Before the dotted line is when we were releasing in 19 clusters, and you see little difference between the intervention and control clusters, they overlap. And after, with the releases in four clusters, you start seeing a little separation about three months after the releases started in four clusters, and this separation continues until we stop the releases. The graph below is showing the total rain in millimeters from local environmental stations, and you can see that the raises and falls in the number of mosquitoes follow the rain patterns. Next. And in this graph, the y-axis is showing the estimated ratio of female mosquito counts in the intervention clusters to the control clusters. These are these graphic showing ratios. The, the x-axis is showing the time starting in January 2021 when we started the releases in only four clusters. The ratios less than one are shown below the horizontal gray line, and this means that the intervention cluster has a significantly smaller count per trap and per week than the control clusters. And all of this is after we adjusted for confounders like temperature and rainfall that could affect the number of mosquitoes. On average, over the intervention period, we found that mosquito counts in the intervention clusters were 51% of the control clusters, so a reduction of about half of the population. Next. So we did found suppression levels lower than expected, about half, and we investigated during and after the study the potential reasons for these results. Next. So we thought what, what is happening with the fitness of the mosquitoes that we were releasing. The shipment containers were developed specifically for this project, and we continue to optimize them during the study. The different vessels types are on the, y, on the X axis, the different versions. And on the Y axis, this graph is showing a measure of mosquito fitness that is the proportion of wild female mosquitoes that mated with Volvacia males. To do this experiment, 10 males with Volvacia that have been packed and shipped are released with 10 wild males, so regular mosquitoes, and 10 wild females, and they're all placed in a cage. If at least half of the female mosquitoes mate with the Volvacia males, then they are considered as fit as the wild females. And that measure is showed, shown there in the dotted line. The graph shows that earlier ver version of our vessels were not that great, and there were improvements along the way. Most of our achievements were done with the version 3.1. That, that was good, but it had some variability. Next. And this is the same experiment, but here we're comparing the fitness of freshly reared, so not shipped mosquitoes, mosquitoes that were shipped on time and mosquitoes that were delayed. We know that shipping had a fitness fitness cost in the mosquitoes, but these two additional experiments suggest that even a greater fitness cost is suspected with delayed shipments. Next. And then we thought, what about the number of mosquitoes? Is it enough? So overflowing ratios are shown in the y-axis and uh, time is shown in the x-axis for each treatment cluster here, so four clusters. Most ratios range from five to one to 20 to one and were considered adequate based on previous experiences in other uh, studies and geographical areas. However, in our study, there was a lot of heterogeneity and in some clusters, there were traps that consistently showed lower um, overflowing ratios. These ratios were probably not enough to compensate for the fitness cost from packing and shipping mosquitoes. Next. There were persistent islands with high mosquito counts. To the left, you can see a heat map that is showing the weekly female mosquito counts from the AGO traps. And to the right, there is the geographic location of these traps. You can see a trap in the middle with uh, the yellow one with um, um, high mosquito counts. And this is located in a public housing complex where the vans of the study could not drive through. So while there was good control around it, the ones with the uh, circled green circles around, there were a few traps in the center, in the center with high counts. Next. And in response to these challenges, we adjusted the releases strategy and implemented hand releases in certain areas where it was required. Next. Next. 
So in summary, we were not able to evaluate the epidemiological impact of Wolbachia mosquito releases due to the low dengue transmission levels in our uh, population. We modified the study from 19 to four clusters to respond to preliminary analysis um, of suboptimal suppression levels. We were able to improve packing and shipping methods, but more work is needed for sure. The suppression was about half on average, despite similar ratios of mosquitoes to uh, other previous studies. We modified the releases to improve mosquito numbers, to improve mosquito distribution, and to improve mosquito fitness. And we think that suboptimal suppression levels were due to a combination of factors, but most likely reduced fitness after long shipping. And besides the um, essays that I show you, we did multiple different essays to try to determine additional reasons for uh, the low suppression levels, but the ones that I show you are the most relevant and we don't think there are additional uh, reasons for this. Uh, and not shown here is that another uh, important conclusion of our study was the high acceptability of Wolbachia suppression in our population. Um, and um, this uh, study will allow us to continue building in this experience, to continue evaluating and implementing mosquito vector controls in Ponce and in Puerto Rico. Next. And to finalize, I, I want to end recognizing the collaborations and the teams that worked very hard for this study to be implemented. This was the first volvacia based technique implemented in the Caribbean and in Puerto Rico. Our cohort, COPA, continues. Now is the year five, and hopefully we will be able to present our work with other vector control methods in uh, evaluation and implementation soon. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. Our final presentation, GPS tracking of free roaming cats on SARS-CoV-2 infected mink farms in Utah is by Dr. Brian Ammon. Please pick them when you're ready. Uh, hi, and thank you. And thank you to the organizers for having me uh, speak today. Um, I appreciate it. Um, this presentation is gonna um, detail the results of a small project that we did while responding to an outbreak of um, uh, SARS coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 in mink farms in Utah. Uh, next slide, please. In July and August of 2020, um, <clears throat> there was an outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 reported in, in several mink farms uh, in Utah, and the CDC was invited to perform ecological investigations uh, at some of these farms. Uh, and we went out there in August of, of 2020, uh, and when we went there, we noticed these large uh, populations of free roaming and feral cats. As you can see in that bottom picture there, this is one of the farms. Um, and, and just a, a quick little definition, a feral cat is pretty understandable by most folks as just being a wild cat. But free roaming, um, they're, they're a little bit different in that they are uh, unwary or they're wary and untrusting of humans, but they're still sort of dependent on humans for food. And in the case in point are the cats in the lower picture in the farm complex itself that, that fed regularly on mink feed and hunted rodents within the farm, and they would tolerate your presence, but if you approach them, they would scatter. Um, and we knew at the time we were out there that these cats were susceptible uh, to the SARS-CoV-2 virus infection uh, and able to transmit from one cat to another. Uh, and this was evident in uh, uh, experimental infections that were performed. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, while we were at, from using some data that we collected in August 2022, uh, there was some sequencing that was done, and, and it was um, determined that these cats were getting infected uh, via the mink, and that sort of prompted the justification for this GPS project study. We were interested to see if these cats uh, coming into contact with the mink were then taking the virus uh, outside of the mink farm and wandering around with it. So our objectives were to capture some of these cats on these infected farms uh, take samples from them, non-destructive samples, and fit them with a GPS collar so that we could track their movements uh, over the course of uh, several days uh, and compare their, their movement area uh, and their, their behavioral or analyze their, their cat movements in and around the meat sheds and homes and surrounding neighborhoods. Um, now, the illustration here on the right-hand side of the screen is, is an actual mink farm. It's just all the identifying markers have been pulled out of there uh, for uh, privacy regions, reasons, 
Uh, but the two lines running vertical and horizontal are essentially a country road. All the purple boxes are, are farmhouses or adjacent farms. And then the orange box with the black lines uh, in the screen itself uh, is the actual meat farm. And the, and the black lines represent meat sheds. And the orange box is sort of a, a perimeter. That's very typical of a lot of these meat farms. It's, it's to keep people out, to keep it from being seen. Uh, so all the meat sheds are within this perimeter. And then the purple house right next to the orange box would then be uh, like the farmhouse of the mink farm. Next slide, please. Uh, so for the methods, we used tomahawk live traps to capture the cats. We baited them with canned cat food or tuna, uh, and we left them overnight or monitored them very closely on some of the farms with a huge population of cats. As about every 30 minutes, we'd have a cat enter the trap looking for food. And of course, we had other animals that entered the trap as well, and we opportunistically sampled them uh, and released them as well. Now, the cats that we targeted were the free roaming and feral cats only. Um, and uh, the, the pet hat cats or the farm pet cats were identified by the farmers as being a pet, uh, but they did um, interact quite freely with some of these free roaming and feral cats. Uh, out there in the yard, and we observed that personally while this was going on. We also only targeted adults and juvenile cats of about approximately one year and give or take a couple of months, and this was done by size. So kittens were not used in this study at all. So after the cats were captured, uh, we would bring them back to a, a central processing site and sedate them. Uh, next slide, please. And then take our samples and this consisted of, of oral body rectal and nasal swabs uh, and then a blood sample and the samples were analyzed using qrt pcr and uh, for serology the cdc mix and read assay um, and then of course the cdc uh, or sequences obtained from some of these samples were, were sequencing done at the cdc as well now while the cats were still sedated uh, we would apply a pit tag um, to ensure that we would be able to recognize the cat if we were able to cap, if we captured it again in the same period and the GPS unit fell off, or if there were subsequent studies done on these farms, which there were in December, uh, we'd recognize this cat as having been captured before. We also used the pit tag readers to identify or to look for uh, uh, markers or chips that were put in by veterinarians to identify at least a previously owned cat or a, a, a pet cat. Um, uh, so we would not sample that one. And then, of course, while under sedation, the GPS collar was attached and the cat was released. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the GPS collars that we used were basically uh, modified bat collars. Um, we used these in Africa for some of the larger fruit bats. Uh, and, and these were developed by telemetry solutions uh, technologies in California. But essentially, um, what we would do is we'd cut everything away that wasn't a working part of the GPS unit, and then we'd attach that to a breakaway cat collar that we purchased at a local farm and ranch supply store. And these breakaway collars would pull apart um, pretty easy, uh, so we weren't worried about the cats getting hung up on a fence or a tree branch, and we knew that they would fall off eventually uh, because the plastic was pretty cheap. Uh, the GPS were pre-programmed using uh, uh, software to take a GPS point every 20 minutes for the, the first three days, every 40 minutes for day four, and then every 60 minutes for uh, days five and after. And this was done to maximize battery life. Next slide, please. Um, we would collect the data wirelessly using uh, a base station, and we would put the base station out in an open area with a, uh, and trying to maximize uh, the line of sight. Um, and we can, you can see in some of these pictures, we've got it attached to a two by four where we'd set it in the corner of the farm uh, and then hoist it up. So it would give us a nice 360 degree range uh, around the farm. Now, the thing that you see hanging off the battery in that upper right hand picture or off the um, base station in the upper right hand picture is a lawnmower battery. And this provided continual power for the span of five to six days. Um, the base stations, the picture on the lower left has a cell phone battery in it and will run for five or six hours or turn it on and turn it off very quickly and that's sufficient. But if you want to leave it for longer periods, you need a continual source. Um, so we fixed it so that we would have that source via a lawnmower battery and then you protect it from the elements with the plastic. Um, the, the battery or the uh, base station itself had a short range and the long range wireless 
uh, data download capacity of greater than two kilometers. Um, so that if the cat that we marked got within anywhere within two kilometers or a little bit, um, we would get that data downloaded. We also put one of these base stations in the vehicles as we drove to and from the farms in case the cat was farther out and we happened to pass by it, um, we'd get some data that way. Next slide, please. Um, once we got the data, uh, we were able to download that using Telemetry Solutions Caller software. And that downloaded the data in a text file called TSD file. And within this software, I could convert that TSD file into a KML file, which then I could open up in Google Earth. And Google Earth, uh, I used two programs basically to calculate these movement areas. But Google Earth was nice because you'd open up and you'd see the entire tracking of the cat with labels, uh, tie points, dates, et cetera, all over um, a Google Earth image. Uh, and from there, I was able to calculate a polygon area. And the nice thing about Google Earth is that it allowed for modification so I could make different colors and fatter lines and, and determine which cat was what and put them all together if I wanted to. But the, the downside was that it, it didn't seem to me at the time, and it may be because I used it incorrectly, but it didn't seem to be very precise. I could see little squigglies in, in a line going from one point to another, um, and that gave me concern. So I switched to a program uh, free on the internet called Headwall Photonic. And you upload the KML file and you could draw a very precise uh, minimum convex polygon around um, the, uh, the movement area, uh, but it did not allow for any modification. It was basically all one color uh, and, and just not very visually stimulating. So I would calculate the precise area in Headwall Photonic and then do whatever kind of color manipulation I wanted in Google Earth. Uh, so those both worked out very well. Next slide, please. Um, now, getting back to that sequence data that sort of gave us the justification. Well, actually, before I do that, um, we were able to collar 15 of these cats uh, and release them. Um, and the data, when we got it back to the CDC analyzed, we had eight of 15 cats that were positive for SARS-CoV infection. Uh, two of the 15 were positive for RNA or detectable RNA. Uh, four of the 15 had antibody reactive to SARS-CoV-2 infection or it, RNA. And then two of these 15 cats uh, had both RNA and uh, antibody. Um, and getting back to the full sequence, uh, the genome sequence that sort of justified us doing this project, the upper phylogenetic tree shows a, a, a grand, a, a huge tree with lots of samples taken from all kinds of farms. Uh, and the, the darker lines highlighted in that, you can see that clade basically is panel B and panel B is exploded below and you can see the yellow dot from the cat from farm three. Oh, yep, yeah, from farm three mixed in with all the mink taken from farm three. And the evidence is suggesting that it was mink to cat transmission. And that's sort of what led us to say, we wanna know where these cats are going. Next slide, please. Um, so the results, once we got the data collected, uh, we were able to get results on 13 cats. Um, Two of them never came back or returned any results and the collars may have fallen off or they may have been truly feral cats and just disappeared after, after we did our thing. Um, but of the 13 cats, we determined um, that uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 SARS infected cats frequently entered these mink sheds. Um, they moved a lot through the surrounding properties, be they farms or, or neighborhoods, uh, and they spent a large amount of time in these multi-house neighborhoods. And one of the things we were able to detect was an age bias among uh, older and younger cats uh, in that if you look at the red box on the top, the juvenile spent uh, significantly more time in the meat sheds than did the adults. Uh, and if you look at the next red box down, they spent more time in the meat sheds or they had more visits on the top box and they spent more time uh, in the lower box. So the juvenile spent a lot of time in these meat sheds. Next, please. Uh, when we're looking at minimum convex polygons as movement areas, um, the figure on the left-hand side of the screen is an illustration of a minimum convex polygon. And the dark lines are all the tracks of a, a cat, a theoretical cat. And when you develop a minimum convex polygon, you essentially just connect all the outer dots and everything inside is that minimum movement area. The figure on the right is an actual cat track uh, for one particular cat over several days. And that minimum convex polygon or movement area is what was compared. And you'll recognize that figure 
as the one from the first one I showed you. So it was an actual farm and cat track. Next slide, please. Uh, when we look at this movement area, um, it was calculated first in hectares, which is 10,000 meters squared. And we're looking at detectable SARS-CoV uh, cats. Um, for RNA positive cats, the minimum movement area uh, or the average minimum movement area was 12.4 hectares. And it ranged anywhere from 2.27 to over 50. Antibody positive cats also had a range of, of just over 12 hectares with a, a um, uh, movement area ranging from just under one hectare to over 50 again. Um, we, we analyzed infected and uninfected cats and their movement areas and didn't find any significant difference between those two groups at all. Um, the figure on the right-hand side, again, is an actual uh, cat track at a different farm. Um, and the grayed out area with the houses, I don't know if you can see their little tiny houses, but that is a, basically a subdivision. And you can see this infected cat wandering in and around uh, the subdivisions. Uh, there was a school nearby, a trailer park nearby. Um, so these cats were wandering around farms, neighborhoods, um, schools, the whole nine yards. Next slide, please. So in conclusion uh, with this study, we determined that free roaming and feral cats are, first of all, susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection from these minks on these mink or from the mink on the mink farms. Um, it's probable that it was a mink to cat transmission of SARS-CoV-2, although we cannot rule out other types of transmission, uh, but it's more than likely mink to cat. These infected cats roam large areas, uh, up to 50 hectares. Uh, and this, in and of itself, can extend the risk of infection um, over broad areas to farm pets uh, like domesticated cats that spend their time playing around or, or coming into contact with the, the free roaming and feral cats and then going into the house. Uh, it can also extend the risk to prairie domestic and sylvan wildlife like deer mice, raccoons and skunks, uh, even deer and wood rats. The surrounding homes and multi-home neighborhoods um, being visited by these cats are also at risk, especially with their own household pets. Uh, and overall, this does represent a risk, albeit low, uh, to infection with human, especially uh, with humans, especially in light of, of the, the probable cat to human infection that occurred in Thailand with a sick cat and a veterinarian there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, all the people that were involved in this study, uh, especially all my co-authors, uh, and all the different organizations that contributed uh, to this study as well. Um, the, the paper, the publication is shown on the right. And if you want, you just Google Earth it or send me an email and I'll be happy to, uh, uh, to send you a copy. Next slide, please. Uh, and of course, thank you. And I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions during the question and answer period. Thanks so much, Dr. Ammon. So thanks to all of today's speakers for your informative presentations. Um, links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash 2020 slash april .html. We do have a few minutes um, for questions. So as a reminder, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send in your question um, and include the presenter's name or topic. So we'll start out with a question for Dr. Stapleton. Somebody commented that... Um, it, it sounds as if your findings uh, were not unexpected. So was there anything um, that did catch the researchers by surprise um, or anything that you did not expect that was found during this process? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. Um, and, and you're right, these findings are consistent with previous studies, which have demonstrated that increased access to unpasteurized milk um, is associated with increased outbreaks and, and illnesses. Um, so that those findings, in a way, I guess you could say, were expected. Some some surprising or outstanding findings. Um, you know, I think two things come to mind for me. First is just the the large number of children that were affected. Um, almost fifty percent of of patients in outbreaks from 2013 to 2018 were children, and and that's a concerning finding to me. Most uh, primarily because um, you know children are often getting their sources of nutrition from caregivers and, and parents and aren't necessarily making these decisions themselves. And children are also more susceptible like um, other, uh, other groups um, of people who are at higher risk for severe outcomes or hospitalization as a result of infection. Um, so that was one you know, notable finding. The other 
uh, finding that stood out to me was just the number of states where amendments were made to expand access. Um, and, and one thing that wasn't presented today is that we, at the same time as conducting this study, had a companion study ongoing that's in the process of, of being published that was a needs assessment survey of uh, essentially um, subject matter experts at the state and local level surveying what they um, knew and needed in terms of preventing illnesses related to unpasteurized milk and what a lot of uh, a lot of the data we collected from several states indicated that there are um, additional efforts to expand access to unpasteurized milk in multiple different states um, and so that this is going to be a continued need for public health officials, veterinarians, healthcare providers, all of us to kind of work together collaboratively to share this information to policymakers that increased access leads to increased outbreaks and illnesses and having this updated data available as these laws continue to change moving forward, I think is really important. Thank you for that question. Thank you. And then we also had a couple questions asking about whether there's any testing, pre-harvest testing or testing of cows that could be done um, to maybe decrease the risks associated with raw milk. Yeah, so that that is also a great question and hits on a, a, an important point. Um, you know, I think I first start considering all the different ways that milk can become contaminated um, throughout production. Um, even with the best practices in place on the farm in terms of hygiene, or even with testing protocols, there's multiple different routes, including cow feces directly contacting the milk, infection or any pathogen that the, the cow itself might be carrying, um, you, being transmitted into the milk, bacteria that live on the skin of the cow, the environment, all the feces and dirt that might be in the environment, insects, rodents, other animal vectors, or, or even humans can cross-contaminate milk. So once you start thinking about all of these different ways that, that milk can become contaminated, it becomes less feasible to kind of test and determine that um, you know, that there is, is reduced burden of, of specific pathogens on a farm. And also important to note that a negative test doesn't necessarily mean the absence of a pathogen. So truthfully, even though over the years we've had great improvements on farms to improve hygiene and improve processes to reduce the burden of pathogens in milk, truthfully, pasteurization is what's established as the best method of reducing and eliminating pathogens from milk and is still um, you know, the best practice outside of any improvements that could be done uh, pre-harvest. Thank you. Got it, thank you. Um, our next question is for Dr. Sanchez Gonzalez. We had a couple of questions about um, the socialization in the community for this effort and whether you did um, an informed consent process for the community where you released the mosquitoes. Could you talk a little bit about that? Of course, yes. Um, we, we know the Puerto Rico Vector Control Unit developed a broad campaign uh, informing of the project. And before that, they had different meetings and conversations with community leaders, with environmental groups, with uh, the media, academia. Uh, it, was, it was a whole Puerto Rico-wide effort to get the opinion and the concerns of different uh, stakeholders in Puerto Rico. Uh, and the campaign was directed towards everybody in Ponce, so people had the opportunity to see what the project was about in the different areas in, in town, not just the ones where mosquitoes were going to be released. And we assessed the acceptability of the method, both through quantitative uh, data and qualitative data with uh, discussion groups and with questionnaires. And the acceptability of the method was really high, close to 90% of participants were um, very happy with the, the method. Some of them were um, uh, neutral and some very, very few less than a handful of complaints about uh, the releases of mosquitoes. Male mosquitoes don't bite, so uh, we didn't expect a lot of complaints about even if the number of mosquitoes increases, they don't bite and should not be um, a problem with the with the. Uh, communities. And we did not do uh, individual informed consent, but uh, there was a, a different channels for people to be able to reach to the Puerto Rico Vector Control Unit and, and 
uh, inform of any concern they had with the with the releases. Great, thank you. And then we have time just for one last quick question um, for Dr. Ammon. We have a couple questions about uh, testing of non-cat wildlife during your study. Um, did any other animals that were trapped uh, test positive for SARS-CoV-2? Uh, well, in the study that we did, no, um, but those same animals that you saw on the slide uh, were tested positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2 in, in other studies. Um, there's another uh, re really good one by uh, Kosovoom and then Han Ip also found wildlife species that were positive for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but our the two animals that you saw that we opportunistically sampled were not positive, but we do know that they can become infected. Great, thank you. Unfortunately, we've run out of time for questions. If you have other questions for today's presenters, we've included their email addresses on this slide um, on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar and in today's email newsletter. And as a reminder, a video of today's webinar will be posted within 30 days. Next slide, please. Please join us for the next Zohu Call on May 3rd. And thank you again for your participation. This ends today's webinar.